Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Is that working? Is it? Is it working? Okay. We're going to get started. Our, our speaker today is Joshua Ford. He's one of our ophthalmic pathology and research fellows. He's working with uh, Dr. Mamos and Dr. Warner. Um, he was born in, he grew up in Sylvester, Georgia, went to Yale for his undergraduate and graduated from Dartmouth for medical school. He's in the process of applying to ophthalmology residency now. He's going to be presenting on light adjustable lenses. And so, yeah. All right. Uh, can can you all hear me just fine? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, so thanks, Brian, for that introduction. So I'm Josh Ford. I'm going to be presenting to you all on light adjustable lenses and other adjustable intraocular lens power technologies. And just before we even start, I want to make it abundantly clear I have no financial interest in any material or methods presented this morning, y'all could look at my bank account and make that <laughs> same conclusion. Uh, however, I do work in the, ma in the lab with Dr. Mamlis and Werner, and through working with them, I, am, I do interact with one of the companies that will be presented today called Calhoun. Uh, we're working with their lag adjustable lens, and so I have gotten free meals from them, about $20 worth, so I just wanna <laughs> cover my bases here. <laughs> Uh, some of my co-fellows are uh, Scott Cole and uh, Justin Cole. I'm sure some of y'all have gotten to know them quite well. Also working in the lab is uh, a, a first-year medical student, Gareth Gardner, um, as well as Dr. Fasavada, who comes by every Friday and helps us out with our studies. So as Brian Stagg mentioned, I am from a little town called Sylvester. It's located in southwest Georgia in Worth County. Um, now, what we pride ourselves on down in South Georgia is our ability to make some of the finest pe uh, peanuts in the country. We are actually home of the Peter Pan Peanut Butter Factory. <laughs> uh, and every year we have what's called the Peanut Parade every second or third Saturday uh, of October. So that's coming up for us. It's always a fun activity for you. Uh, so some famous folks are from Georgia. I'm sure y'all have all know about President Jimmy Carter. He's from Plains, Georgia, right near me. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was originally a peanut farmer who then grew up and became president of the country. If any of y'all are San, San Francisco Giants fans, we're also home of Buster Posey. He's from Leesburg, Georgia. Uh, he was on the 2010 winning, uh, World Series winning team as well as the 2012 team. Uh, we are also home of Philip Phillips. He's also from Leesburg, Georgia. He was the winner of the 11th American Idol competition. <laughs> Ann Paula Dean. Uh, she's from Albany. She was originally born in Albany, Georgia, but she made her empire out in Savannah. So if y'all are ever in Savannah, I highly recommend y'all going to her, uh, to her restaurant. And we're also known for producing the Shirley Temple of our generation in Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> She's from uh, McIntyre, Georgia. So, so what I'm presenting to y'all today is a, from a review article that Drs. Mamlis and Werner and I are working on. We're in the final stages of completing it, and we hope to submit it in the next several weeks. Uh, we just have to run through one more, one or two more editings of it. Uh, so hopefully y'all be able to read that in the next several months. So what we'll do first is we'll elucidate a problem within ophthalmology. Then we're going to introduce the concept of what an adjustable intraocular lens is. And then there are about 10 modalities that I'm going to try to run, run across just very briefly, uh, go over all the clinical and preclinical research that's available on those technologies, go over any questions or comments that y'all have at the end, and then that'll be it. And hopefully we'll get y'all back in clinic uh, uh, on time. So one of the problems in ophthalmology uh, that has been identified is that incorrect intraocular lens power still remains one of the most frequent causes of IOL exchange, um, despite all of the advances that we've seen in the past several decades. Owing to this uh, are a few studies uh, by Branser and by Murphy. Branser in 1997 showed that of 298 amitropic patients having FACO or extracraft surgery, when they emerged from that surgery, only about 45% of those were within half a diopter of intended refraction postoperatively. And a bigger study by Murphy in 2002 uh, 
consisting of 1,676 eyes, only 72.3% were within one diopter and then uh, of uh, planned refraction, and 6.4% were beyond two diopters. But I think some of the more compelling uh, research on this topic are the Mam uh, Dr. Mamlis's foldable IOL surveys. So just to remind y'all very so politely, uh, there's fa foldable IOL surveys in every OR. I uh, figured Mamlis, Dr. Mamlis would like for y'all to know that. Um, so he's been doing this foldable IOL survey and has been publishing that ever since 1998. He publishes it once a year. And you can see here with a three-piece silicon IOL, uh, the reason for explanting that uh, was very commonly intra uh, incorrect lens power, and that was in you know, between 20 and 50 percent of exploitations over a course of 1998 to 2007. For three-piece hydrophobic acrylic IOLs, uh, lenses were explanted, uh, or 50, somewhere between 20 and 60 percent of those cases, uh, or lenses were explanted because of incorrect lens power. And then for a one-piece plate silicone IOL, somewhere between 10 and 30-ish percent were explanted for incorrect IOL power. And so going into some of the reasons why lenses are explanted, I mean, you can group them into various, uh, various categories, but some of them are due to technological in inadequacies, such as incorrect axial length, incorrect corneal power determinations, incorrect A constants. So it's just looking at the technology and the, the formulas that are used to determine the IOL power preoperatively and some of the assumptions made, uh, as well as mechanical issues. So when you put the lens in the bag, does it say in, or does it go in the correct or the presupposed position that it should go into? And then especially with toric lenses, you have to consider you know, axis deviation. And then some reasons are just darn unacceptable. The fact that IOLs can be mislabeled by the manufacturer or the wrong IOL might be inserted. And so in a study by Drs. Jen and Dr. Crandall back in 2007, they identified incorrect axial length and incorrect corneal power determination to be some of the more common reasons, or the most common reasons for post-op IOL power. Uh, incorrect post-op IOL power. So considering where we are today, where millions and millions of people are getting LASIK surgery, where in our current arsenal of IOLs, they generally come in half a power, uh, half a dioptric power gradations, and the fact that patients' expectations are increasing. Uh, do we think that this, th these certainly won't help with this problem, and so that's, there's, so that's where uh, adjustable lens technologies come into play. And what an adjustable lens is, is any sort of lens that can be adjusted postoperatively to provide the patient with amyotropic refraction. Now these lenses can be adjusted either invasively through some sort of insert surgery after they've been implanted or non-invasively through perhaps changing the properties of the materials of the lens after it's been inserted. And so I'm going to run through all of these lenses. We're going to start off talking about those that can be inva adjusted invasively. And then uh, we're going to start talking about those that can be uh, adjusted non-invasively. And we're going to conclude uh, with the light adjustable lens as made or as manufactured by Calhoun Vision. And one of the things that, one of the take home messages I want y'all to get from this is that these tend to be, these seem to be the more superior technologies. And, and if I were a begging man, which I don't know, after losing $70 on a slot machine one time, I don't really think I'm a betting man, but I would think that these uh, will, will have the, the most promise for becoming part of the mainstay of cataract surgery in the future. So we're gonna talk about the multi-component lens. Uh, so this lens, uh, the multi-component, just as its name implies, it's made of different lens components that can come together and make a, make a whole lens. Uh, so here is the base of the lens, uh, and this, this was first conceived back in the early 90s and published by Dr. Werbel in 1996. But the base lens right here is a PMMA lens. It's about six to seven, uh, it's about six millimeters wide, so it would have to be inserted through a pretty large incision. 
Uh, so it's implanted first into the caps or bag. Outside of the eye, the middle and the cap lenses are brought together. And then you see this groove right here on the surface of the base lens. It fits perfectly a, uh, the haptic on the middle lens, and that's how it all comes together. So why this technology is a good idea is that if the patient's refractive needs change over time, the surgeon can go in at any point thereafter, take off the middle and cap lens, and replace it with a new middle and cap lens. Another reason why this is important or why this is exciting is because if you consider all the different lenses, uh, all with a, if you consider what the patient's needs, what an entire population's needs are, if you consider that in point .25 dioptric gradations, you would need about 15,000 lenses to treat everyone. Versus this technology, uh, through just by exchanging the middle and the calf lens, you that would number would be more manageable, be a, just on the order of a few hundred. Um, so Dr. Werblin uh, published a uh, just a proof of concept study just to show that if you implant this whole lens into a cat eye, that it would remain stable within the capture bag, that it wouldn't come apart. And in cat eye, eight, eight cat eyes over a six month period that he did demonstrate that to be true. Uh, Infinite Vision Optics is a French, is a France-based company that has basically has used that concept of a multi-component lens, uh, changing it ever so slightly. Um, so, for example, they've made a lens uh, that has the where the front lens has two I/O components held together by hydrostatic forces. Also, the front lens sits in front of the anterior capsule. Reason this is is because Dr. our very own Dr. Werner here has published extensively on a concept called interlenticular opacification, which is a known complication of the piggyback of piggybacking two IOLs together. And so, if theoretically, if, if the front lens sits in front of the anterior capsule, it sh has a much less chance of happening. Uh, so, Dr. Portalio, uh, she has published a study which was recently published. Uh, in JCRS in 2013, uh, where two, uh, it's a two-year follow-up study of six adult patients receiving the Infinite Vision multi-component IOL. What she demonstrated over the course of two years is that no interlenticular opacification occurred, uh, there was no corneal damage induced by the lens, and the, the lens was stable rotationally within the capsular bag. Uh, she also showed that decimal visual acuity improved from, uh, the uncorrected decimal visual acuity improved from 0.11 to 0.68, and the, the corrected decimal visual acuity improved from 0.28 to 0.83 over that two-year follow-up study. Uh, one of the things that she advocates for is, or she advertises, is that this could be a very awesome technology in terms of uh, managing a congenital cataract because you think of putting a lens into a, a baby's eye and over time their axial length and their refractive needs change. So if you could put the, put, insert this lens into the, uh, into the child's eye and then over time change it out, the, the front part, uh, while the child's refractive needs change. So going on to the mechanically adjustable lens and this is developed by Acrotech. Uh, and published on extensively by Dr. Jan. This is a German-based lens. But this is, uh, the way that this works is that this is a PMMA lens. It's about six millimeters uh, wide. Uh, the, the optic is about six millimeters wide. And so it would have to be inserted through a huge incision. Um, but as you can see on the edge of the optic, there's a one millimeter high cylinder. And on the edge of the haptic, is a piston. The piston fits within the cylinder, and the way adjustment is made is you put this in, and then with some specialized optic manipulators, you adjust this in the anterior posterior direction with those manipulators, and that's how you get adjustment. What Dr. Jan showed was that you have an adjustment range of about two to two and a half diopters, so about one and a half diopter per millimeter. Uh, this has been ex studied extensively in animals and in human studies. So for the six, for the short-term and long-term rabbit studies, they showed rotational stability, easy removability of this lens, 
mechanical stability during adjustment, and uh, they didn't show it, see any evidence of intraocular damage on history pathology, and those were in short and long-term rabbit eye studies. In human studies consisting of 35 eyes, uh, they showed that there's no difference in visual acuity inflammation and intraocular pressure between this and a, just a conventional PMMA lens up to 15 months. They also showed that midriatic refraction improved from about one plus one to zero diopters. Uh, what they did, however, find was that there was an increased incidence of posterior capsular opacification that happened in about 18 of 35 eyes. But fortunately, that was treatable with YAG capsulotomy in all patients. So going on to repeatedly and ma magnetically adjustable lenses, and you can see I sort of brought them together, and then you'll, you'll, you'll see why. Uh, so this is a repeatedly adjustable IOL, which was de developed by Dr. Uh, by Dr. Eggleston and published on extensively by Dr. Matthews. And these folks are based out of the University of Missouri. What this consists of is a PMA lens with an inner optic and an outer ring. The inner optic uh, can be adjusted by uh, moving it in the anterior and posterior direction, but in a screw-like fashion within that outer ring. Uh, Dr. Matthews uh, published a paper just to show that, just to prove, uh, for, for proof of concept, basically showing that the rotational force required for a power adjustment uh, was well below a target maximum of one and a half ounce inches. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because you're rotating this thing, and if you have to apply a lot of pressure, you're going to maybe you know, rupture that capsular bag, you're going to mess up the zonules, and you'll cause some damage in the anterior chamber. Um, but the force required to do that wasn't significant at all. So imagine using that same lens and then fashioning it, some magnets within that lens and having an external source and being able to adjust that with that external magnet magnetic source. Uh, so, and that's what Dr. Matthews did, and he published the same, this paper the same year as his uh, repeatedly adjustable lens. Um, so using a magnetic spindle consisting of samarium cobalt and an external source consisting of neodymium iron boride, uh, he basically showed that you can get, you can screw this inner optic within the outer optic, and for a 26 diopter lens, you can focus that within 0 .04 diopters. And for a 16 diopter lens, you can focus that within 0 0.01 diopters. Uh, they also did some leaching studies on this lens to show that over time, if you, if you, if you put this in solution, over time, it, the magnetic components aren't going to just come out. And that's what they did. They showed that the, in leaching studies that compared to, you get about the same concentration of, of leakage as you will with a bare magnet in solution. They didn't. Yeah, that 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 was the very question I had, and it wasn't mentioned on that. I, I I don't I don't actually know. I don't really know much about samarium cobalt. And I, I would think that that would be <laughs> important. The thing with this lens is it hasn't been published on since 2003. Is and as far as my knowledge goes, Dr. Eggleston, who designed this, he he's since retired. So I don't really think that this is going anywhere, but it's, it's an interesting concept for nonetheless. Um, so going on to the liquid crystal lens with wireless control, and now we're getting into lenses that can be adjusted uh, non-invasively. So just before I even go on and tell you about this lens, I just want to sort of go over what a liquid crystal lens is. Uh, when you think about this, you have to think of just going back to general chemistry, the three phases of matter, solids and liquids. Solids, in solids, the, the molecules are oriented in a parallel light fashion. Their positions relatively relative to each other are fixed versus a liquid, which there's more random positioning of the molecules with respect to each other. For a liquid crystal, a, li a liquid crystal basically uh, has the features of a solid and that of a liquid, as you can see, roughly parallel lines, but some movability. Because of that, the liquid crystal lens is, a, is amenable to uh, uh, adjustment via electricity and by mag magnetism. 
And that has actually led to a lot of uh, <laughs> applications uh, so far, such as the LCD screens on uh, cell phones and the big screen TVs that we all have in our homes to watch football games. Um, so Dr. Simonoff, uh, this is based out of the Netherlands here. He's made a lens uh, just basically out of liquid crystals uh, that can be adjusted from an external source. So the way he was able to do this, you, you take a functional generator, connect it to a modulator, uh, which the signal is then amplified and then with a, transmitted, uh, with a transmitting antenna, signal is sent to a receiving antenna, which is on the lens surface. That signal is then demodulated uh, into a voltage, which is then applied to the liquid crystal lens surface. And here's just a schematic of the lens that he's been able to produce. So you can see right here, this is a liquid crystal lens. It's about 40 micrometers thick. I, this is a scary thing to go in your eye. I know, <laughs> I know. I'm not, I'm not even going to joke around here about that. So, <laughs> but the liquid crystal is between a high ohmic and a low ohmic uh, material, which applies the magnet. Voltage to the lens and thus allows it to change the, uh, the, the, the refractive ability of the lens. And so here's the lens, uh, as you can see, wrapped around or coiled around it is the antenna, and right here is the rectifying diode. Now, he's been able to show in initial in vitro studies that you can get about 2.5 diopters of adjustment. Uh, and they're currently working on encasing this whole thing within a silicon based material so that you, you so that you're the contents of your <laughs> interior chamber aren't exposed to all of this junk right here. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to this lens called the Alenza Autofocal Lens. This is actually uh, being developed uh, and uh, they have the, the it's, it's an autofocal auto accommodating lens which doesn't really go into the topic that I'm talking about today but it does exploit the uses of liquid of LC, uh, liquid crystals. This lens right here, basically what reason it's so awesome is that there are sensors in the optic of the lens that measure pupillary dynamics. And so that if the patient needs, to, it can measure what, if the pupil is trying to constrict and it can help with accommodation. So maybe we're thinking about doing a paper on accommodation later on in the fellowship, but that it's not really applicable to this surgery, uh, to this uh, uh, presentation, but I figured it was worthwhile mentioning. Uh, going on to femtosecond laser technology, I know that's been a hot topic in ophthalmology in the last decade or so. But uh, what's so? So with a femtosecond laser, this is a, it just in brief, it's a, it's a, femtosecond lasers are able to, to, they have high pulse ability and they're able, you're able to focus on a very small microscopic ta target and without having, producing much collateral damage. And so they've been employed in various, uh, various uh, procedures during a cataract uh, surgery. Uh, so, for example, they've been, uh, they have applications to astigmatic limbal relaxing incisions, to anterior capsulotomies, and to lens fragmentations. So the question is whether or not they can actually produce postoperative ILL adjustments. Um, and so these, what I'm about to present on you, the next few things I'm about to present on you, these are in their very early stages. We weren't able to obtain much information from the companies because they're sort of keeping their lips shut on all this. But Alcon has a patent where they, uh, and this is just a schematic of how it works. It's not quite clear as to what's going on here. But um, if you think, what they, they even have, they're, they're able to fashion a lens with concentric rings that are connected with this internal microstructure. And on this internal microstructure is this uh, heat absorbable material or dye. So just do it looking at the zoom in of this, uh, the photons emitted from the femtosecond laser, if they are, if they hit that dye, they cause sh shrinkage. And so then you get uh, tension 
development between these constituent rings and so the, it becomes thinner. Conversely, if you apply the photon to the, uh, to the internal microstructure, you break it and then you relieve that tension and allow for fattening of the lens. Now that's about as much as they were able to tell us about their lens, um, or as much as is available in that patent that we found online. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Scientific is also working on uh, using the femtosecond laser to make post-operative IOL adjustments. Uh, and most of their stuff has been uh, done by Dr. Joseph Beal. And so he's, he's developed this technology, or he's helped develop this technology called the refractive index vision. With this, the femtosecond laser is applied to a thin layer of uh, amenable material within the optic. And by applying the femtosecond laser, you, you basically excite the electrons. They create a plasma. Bonds are then restructured. And so the way adjustments are made are by altering the refractive index of that material within the optic, as well as by altering its geometry. And so going on that, princi going on that principle, uh, he's also developed dividing the surface of the optic within the various concentric uh, diffractive zones and allowing for multiplicity of the power adjustment that we're able to achieve. So if you consider a single 50 micron lens layer, if it provides five dots as a correct of correction, then if you split that into four, you could get 20 dots as a correction, which is quite significant, <laughs> if I have to say so myself. Um, he's also said that you can get correction using this procedure just by tightening the diffractive rings uh, here along a single axis. And here's some pictures that he was able to provide us. If you look here, this is the thin layer within the lens, so within the lens right here. But he's able to micro, to um, fashion some micro threading patterns onto that thin layer. And here's looking at that pattern sort of looking down interiorly. And then I'm going to talk to you about two phogon chemistry. This is uh, also another exciting thing that's being developed. But I know me showing these organic molecules probably uh, you're recalling horrible days in organic chemistry. So not, not to fear this is, uh, I'll try to make this as simple as possible. So if you consider, so if you apply it, So this is a polymer right here that's covalently attached to what's called coumarin, which is like a dye molecule. The nice thing about coumarin is that it's amenable to uh, this light pho uh, photochemistry. So if you apply photons right here, this causes dimerization of the coum coumarin. When you get dimerized coumarin, uh, you decrease the refractive index. However, conversely, if you apply a light with a different wavelength, you're able to break this bond and reform the uh, the, unpol the unpolymerized uh, or the undimerized coumarin molecules, and so and so get a higher refractive index. Um, and so this is being reported on by doctors uh, Schraub and Hamp. And with this two photon chemistry technology, they've been able to show that you're able to change the refractive index up to 0.03 allowing a fine tuning of up to two and a half diopters. Uh, they also conceived that torque corrections would be available with this technology. Um, and the nice thing about this, and as you'll see later when we talk about the calcium bidecrystal lens, is that this, this reaction is instantaneous. So once you apply that light to the patient, this reaction occurs, and you're able to refract the patient the same day. Uh, another thing about this lens is that, or this technology is that if you're thinking of light being able to change its properties of it, well, the, the theoretically, ambient sunlight doesn't have enough energy to cause this reaction to occur. So theoretically, it's not, this, it's not going to change the refractive index as if your patient's being housed ambient light. And so now I just want to go on and talk about the Calhoun vision lens. This is probably the biggest topic uh, or the biggest subtopic today that we'll talk about just because it's an FD, uh, stage three of FDA clinical design and so it's about to be out, or about to be commercially available probably in the next few years. And 
what the line adjuster lens is, is it's developed by Calhoun Lens. It's a, uh, it's a silicon based lens that's amenable to, uh, that can be uh, adjusted with the use of a digital light delivery system. As it features square optic haptics, those are meant to help with PCO prevention, as modified CPMMA haptics, um, and then the silicon macromer within the optic of the lens that's amenable to light chemistry and able to be able to get adjustments that way. So this is just a schematic showing how, uh, how it works. So consider this is the optic of a lens, and if you wanted to add power to that, you apply light to the center of that lens. The light causes polymerization, which doesn't change the, the refractive power of the lens. However, over time, just based on sheer thermodynamics alone, uh, when, the, when, this when this silicon uh, polymerizes, the silicon macromer in the uh, outside or it more in the periphery, uh, the concentration isn't similar to that in the middle, and so it diffuses down a gradient, and with it brings water, and so you get sort of fattening of the lens. Now, this process takes about 12 to 18 hours to occur within the time of actually applying the light to it, so you do have to wait a day or so to refract these patients. And then at some point thereafter, you're able to lock in the lens. Um, but this whole process takes about two to four weeks to do. So if you're going to get a patient to do this, they need to be very amenable to wearing light protection because while it remains, a, it was originally a theoretical risk that ambient light could actually change this, but there's a case report coming out of Europe where this, this uh, patient didn't do as her doctor said, and she, her refraction just basically tanked in within two weeks, and so they had to exchange the lens. And so if you wanted to subtract the power from the light adjustable lens, what you do is you apply light to the periphery. This is called this polymerization, and through the, vein, the same thermodynamic principle that I mentioned previously, you get thinning in the lens, or you get change in radi the radius of the curvature, and then thus change in power of the lens. And so the way the technique for applying light to the lens is that you have, the, you have a light applicator system, which is basically akin to a slit lamp that's coupled with a computer system. You dilate the patient, so they have to be amenable to dilation. You put some topical anesthesia on, on the cornea, and then you apply a contact lens, and then you have the patient focused on and ready for the target. At the same time, you, uh, you enter the base power and the correction needed into the computer system. The computer determines uh, what power or what intensity of light you need and for how long you need it. And then the lock-in is done at a, you know, a higher intensity at some point thereafter. And also, I forgot to mention the lock-in procedure. After the lock-in, you can no longer adjust this lens. That's, that's it. Um, so here's the digital light delivery system right here. And it's manufactured by Carl Zeiss Magatech. And you can see here, this wheel right here is the pattern that it's going to place uh, on the lens. So here, here's our very own Dr. Werner. Now this picture, you know, shows Dr. Werner basically applying this uh, pattern onto the surface of the lens. And so after this was done, these lenses were explanted. And so uh, Calhoun, they took these lenses and they were able to show that this pattern that she wanted to apply to the lens this is the power that she actually got. Uh, and this is Dr. And sorry, this is a, she's, she's applying an astigmatic or a band shape pattern to the lens. So with, the, with this new digital light delivery system, you're able to get higher, you're able to correct for higher order aberrations as well as for astigmatism. Now here's uh, Dr. Mamlis. He's applying what's called a tetrafold pattern onto that Calhoun light adjustable lens. And so, just as what I described previously, this lens was explanted from the rabbit eye, and they sh Calhoun Vision showed that the tetrafold pattern that Dr. Mamlis intended to apply was actually applied to the lens. And so we know Dr. Mamlis affectionately in the lab as Kramer, for, and I hope I still have a job after this, but <laughs> uh, this is Dr. Mamlis sporting his Kramer hairdo with Dr. Warner, and they're at the, I think this is the 2009 uh, Asterisk uh, video awards presentation, so you'll have to ask him about that. Um, and so our, our lab was the first 
do the various uh, biocompatibility studies with the light adjustable lens. And so using uh, 12 cats, Dr. Lerner uh, back in 2007, and the reason she used cats in this, she's trying to show specifically that applying light to, uh, or, the, or the, the, the intensity of light needed uh, to make the adjustments with the Calvin light adjustable lens are not going to, one, mess up the cornea, or two, mess up the retina. And so she designed this study using cats because their cornea, the, the cornea endothelial cells, have a regenerative capacity akin to that of the humans. Rabbit endothelial cells are very regeneratively robust, so they're, they're not amenable. They, they wouldn't be a good uh, uh, model for this. And so what she did was she applied 250, th this, is the, this is the amount of light needed for um, the locking procedure. She applied it to the right corner, so we'll call those the study eyes, and then the, the, the other eyes, uh, she didn't apply it to. So, and then she sacrificed these uh, cats at one day, one week, and at three months. And then using, she, she, she compared them qualitatively and quantitatively. Uh, qu qualitatively with Trifan Blue and Alizarin Red, and quantitatively with this EPCO uh, system. And this, these are her data. So she showed that there's no, for, there, there's no statistically significant difference between the, the study eye and the control eye suggesting that applying the light source to the, uh, the cornea is not going to uh, cause endothelial shutdown or affect the cornea in any way. She also did uh, a study using uh, eight pigmented rabbits to make sure that the applying a high intensity beam of light is not going to affect the retina. And so what she did was she used study eye oils, which were the Calhoun adjustable lens, which have this uh, UV blocking agent within the optic, and she applied up to five times the expected maximum UV radiation dosages. And then for the control eyes, they don't have this UV blocker in them, so she applied up to two times that amount. Uh, and then one week after irradiation, she examined them with slit lamp and fundoscopic, fundos she, she did a fundus, fundus exam, and then she sacrificed and nucleated and then submitted them for histopathology. And what she showed was that in the control eyes, so those that don't have the UV blocker in them, that you get this retinal scarring. So you see this scarring event right here. But with those that had the study lens, or rather the Calvin light adjustable lens, which has the UV blocker in it, you didn't get any retinal scarring in the study. So that suggesting that uh, applying the light, hi applying a hi the highest intensive light intensity light possible during uh, the adjust or lock-in procedure is not going to affect the retina. And so a lot of the clinical studies on the Calhoun light adjustable lens has been performed by Dr. Chaya. He is, he is based out of Mexico, and he did some of the original studies use, uh, just with uh, myopic and hyperopic adjustments. And he was able to show that in four, uh, 13 and 14 eyes, or about 93% of those, you're able to achieve point, uh, within 0.25 diopters of targeted refraction one day after lock-in. He got about a very similar result with those uh, that required hyperopic uh, adjustment. <coughs> he also did some of the studies with astigmatism with the newer uh, light delivery system. And in all his patients, or all five patients who had astigmatism, he was able to get them within 0.25 diopters of targeted refraction at one day post lock-in. Now, as I mentioned before, um, or folks with axial hyperopia and axial myopia, these folks are very difficult to predict what IOL power they need preoperatively. And so some of the newer studies by Dr. Hengbrer, he's based out of Germany, he was able to show that 93% and 67% of the eyes were within point, a half a diopter and a quarter of a diopter uh, of the target refraction one day post lock-in. And with those uh, with axial myopia, uh, about 96% and 81% of those eyes were within half a diopter or a quarter diopter uh, one day after lock-in. So it's very, you know, you know promising uh, data right here. And then one of the newest publications for this is uh, looking at uh, folks who have already ha who have a history of refractive surgery. Um, and this is a very promising study right here because it showed that he, sh uh, Dr. Brearley showed that 74%, 97% of those eyes 
or within a quarter and a half a die after, after lock-in. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, those folks with axial hyperopia, axial myopia, and those folks with, who have had refractive surgery, it's very difficult to predict whatever IOL power they need preoperatively. But this is very promising because it's a showing us that we could implant a light, light adjustable lens into these patients and get them, most of them, within half a diopter of a targeted refraction. Uh, Calhoun, they're doing studies with, they're, they're adjusting how uh, to incorporate the UV blocker in their optic. Originally, with their first generation lens, the, the uh, UV blocker was just scattered throughout the optic. However, with this next generation of lens, they're applying a, they're, they, they just have a surface applied to the posterior aspect of the lens, and this is called, this is supposed to be the UV blocker right here. The idea behind this is that if you can thin it out, you can perhaps make it so that uh, you don't need that many adjustments. So if you don't need that many adjustments, you might can shorten the, the time after implantation of the lens down to about two weeks that you are able to lock it in. So to help with patient compliance, because as you all can imagine, asking a patient to put a lens, having to wear UV protection for four weeks, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing to ask. And so just a synopsis of everything that we've talked about today. We, we, uh, we've said that inc incorrect IOL power is a significant problem that deserves our attention. Hopefully adjustable IOLs will pr provide a useful way to correct this problem. We've gone over all those IOLs that can be adjusted invasively as well as non-invasively. Um, and then I think I'm, w one of the recurring themes or what I've tried to impress upon you guys is that uh, non-invasive adjustment seems to be superior to invasive adjustment. Uh, the Calhoun light adjustable lens is in stage three of FDA clinical trials. Uh, and so as such, it's closest to commercial availability in the United States. However, and I know I'm opening up a Pandora's box here about concluding on this very final statement, but who's gonna pay for these technologies? These are very expensive technologies. The Calhoun light adjustable lens, uh, I have tried to get some financial data from them. They, they're keeping their lips shut on that, but I was able to find in uh, various papers from, Germ uh, from Europe that the light adjustable lens costs about $1,500 for those patients in Europe. The digital light delivery system costs on the order of $80,000 to $100,000, so that's a very expensive endeavor. And you also consider all this femtosecond laser technology. Those things cost on the order of half, half a million dollars. And who knows how uh, upwards of $70,000 to uh, for annual maintenance fees. And I couldn't get from Calhoun Vision how much the maintenance fees would be for their digital light delivery system. So these are all my references. Sorry. And uh, I just want to thank... Uh, First of all, all of you for attending this presentation. I know it's a significant time investment from your clinical uh, op, uh, clinical responsibilities, so I definitely appreciate y'all being here. I also like to thank Dr. Mamlis and Dr. Werner for taking me on in their lab. Uh, Dr. Cole with a K and Dr. Cole with a C. We that's our nicknames for each. We have nicknames in the lab. So, uh, and Dr. Vasavada, uh, he is an international uh, doctor here. He's he was observing, and but he comes to the lab once a day, or once a week. Uh, also, Alicia Doxon for helping set this uh, Grand Rounds presentation up. And uh, Mary Mayfield, she's our histopath tech, and she does a lot of the ha uh, specimen handling, and she has answered so many questions and has been an invaluable resource. So I just want to ask if y'all have any questions or comments.
just available mm -hmm. because when you've got a few people baby boomers now that are coming up who have an eight bit off pay, no matter how hard you do a measurement, you still get a fifty five implementation. And so this why does it prevent or allow us to do that, let alone the adjustments of recidivism and the adjustments of potential wage gain. Uh, and um, and so this is really an exciting potential technology and we just would like to see it come to the market somehow. Exactly. Well, by the time this comes out, they may be helped by the next technology. So that's, that's the problem. Yeah, these femtosecond technologies. Yeah. On the light adjustable lens. Uh, so in vivo study, or in, sorry, in vitro studies, there's about four diopters. I think we, we've asked Calhoun this question ourselves. It's about two and a half to three diopters on average. For the lag, yeah, silicon lenses are, yeah, foldable. The, yeah, the first ones with the, uh, the mechanically and the multi-component lens, they're made of PMMA, so they're not foldable, and so you need a huge incision to even insert them. Sorry about 